Commission's presentation here. We're very happy to have all of you. Before we begin, I would like to, men to uh, introduce some of our board members that are here tonight. Mr. Tim Strasser, Mr. Chris Nipple, Mr. Mike Priest, and Mr. Kirk Swarskopf. So thank you again. This presentation is to discuss the great things about Delphi Community School Corporation and also look at our financial future. We are extremely proud of our school corporation. We have a wonderful school corporation. I have been here for 12 years and one of the things that attracted me to this amazing school corporation was the moment I came in, I noticed the relationship that the teachers, the staff build with our students. We are a small corporation, which makes it wonderful because our staff know our students. We know each one, we know what their needs are. And that's what makes us an incredible school corporation because we really work on meeting the needs of each individual student. We differentiate and ultimately our goal is for our students to graduate out of our school district and are successful citizens back in our community. Able to either go to an academic field, go off to school, have credentials that they can go right into the workforce and the workplace. Our goal is to make them productive citizens when they leave our building. That's the goal. Besides academics, which we'll talk about here in a minute, we also look at educating the whole student. Leadership skills, collaboration skills, being a good citizen as we talked about, community service are very important to us. We have to teach the whole child. In order to do that, our, each of our buildings has some key programs that really help facilitate leadership skills in our students. The elementary, for example, has the leader in me, the middle school is character strong, and the high school has the resilient youth grant that they received to help with our ninth graders. We also know that dig digital citizenship is extremely important. So we are one-to-one -one in, in our entire school corporation. And we feel that working with the computers is going to help train them for the technology needs that they have later on in their careers. Another thing that's extremely important to us is the community. Community is in our name. We are Delphi Community School Corporation. We are the heart of the school corporation. I'm sorry, the heart of the community, and the community is the heart for us. In that, this picture right here was career day at the elementary, and it was packed. We had tons of community members come and talk about their careers in the heat all day long, working with all of our kids. We had helicopters, we had police cars. It was an incredible day. That is the way our community reaches out and we thank them for doing that. We also have a strong working relationship back with the community. Here's a picture of the print shop that we have, which our students engage in printing um, jobs and banners and pamphlets and different things for our community members. They can order them through our print shop. We also have a computer programming class where they worked on a web design for our chamber. We also had activities with um, Bacon Fest where they had a drone and did a whole video for everyone. Additionally, we also really enforce community service because if we are going to be valuable citizens within our community, we need to give back as well. So as I was talking about the leader in me and resilient youth, we have student, we have service projects at all three of the buildings. This right here is an example of they were getting the mulch and getting everything ready for the Abbey and Libby fields. Okay, academic time. So here goes. We have a wide variety of academics and opportunities, which is extremely difficult to maintain in a small school corporation. We pride ourselves in creating a vast amount of courses in, in advanced placement, and making sure that we have even certifications. For example, our <coughs> CNA students can walk out of here right out of our door with a CNA certification. Our students have the opportunity, 
that they can select from 24 dual credit and AP classes, which if you know anything yet about the AP and the dual credit, you can save a lot of tuition dollars. I know that my daughter walked out, she had enough tuition for her first semester. We had other students that walked out and had a whole year of college based on dual credit and AP. This again is very difficult to do in a small school corporation. Some of the different things we have are agro management business, animal science, AP calculus, AP government, AP music theory, just to name a few. We are right now going to be adding manufacturing into our, excuse me, into our high school program because we also feel like we really need to focus on skills that are just not academic, but we have students that are going to be going into those kind of occupations. So we need to make sure we are well-rounded in our academic options for all students. We also have innovation. Uh, on top of engaging our students through all our different activities academically and through service projects, we also make sure that we have clubs and organizations that the students are involved in. One of these clubs that happened to take off, it was a, a t staff member talking about, you know, the brackets, and they were like, well, let's start meeting, and it formed into a club, and then it became, as you know, nationwide. Uh, actually nationally ranked, you know, stats on this. But, yeah, it was fun. They were sitting around, but it fostered a lot of other skills that we don't think about. We had students that were learning media, data analysis, statistical analysis, public speaking, all of those things just from something they were not even realizing they were learning. Okay. This one's near and dear to my heart, but we have wonderful fine arts in Delphi Community School Corporation. We have got arts, choir, band throughout our elementary, middle school, and high school. And I say this is near and dear to my heart, because my daughter, who came with me when I moved over here to Delphi Community School Corporation, she was very intense in the arts and the drawing and all of those things. And she had so many different opportunities because she was here. And I know this because I have three girls. Two of them were at Tiffany County School District, and one was here. And I know for a fact that Delphi basically saved my daughter in so many ways because she would not have been a lead in a musical at Harrison High School. She would not have been able to do varsity sports. And so we have a lot of students that come here because our size is one-on-one -on -one with staff, but it also offers so many opportunities for them to excel in ways that they can at bigger schools. This right here in our art program, Mrs. Barnes, who was new to us this year, she has created ex extraordinary art program that had actually extends outside of our school. She let them go down to Indy and join an art show, and as you can see, they deserved. There was lots of first place winners on this one. Um, our high school, if you believe it or not, there's something called sticky note art. You know this, like you draw pictures on sticky notes? Yes, well, there's one for that, and our high school, they went down to Indianapolis with sticky note art, and people actually purchased them. Um, so our arts program is, is soaring. Our band and choir is also wonderful, and we are thrilled that we have them in the three buildings. On top of our fine arts, we would be amiss if we didn't talk about our extracurricular activities as well, including athletics. Athletics are extremely important, and statistically, if you did not know this, if students are engaged, whether it be clubs, plays, robotics, baseball, their GPA is generally stronger than students who are not engaged. Students who get engaged outside of just the academics actually tend to be part of the culture of the building, and thus it builds a team atmosphere where they're successful. Therefore, we really strive to make sure we can meet the needs of all students. Now, small schools, it's difficult for example, Rossville does not have a football team because it is difficult to field every single athletic opportunity. We at one point, just to give you some background, we only had two kids that were gonna go for golf. We had a whole discussion about canceling golf across the board. We ended up getting a third person and we thought, you know, if we have three kids, they deserve this. So we went ahead, had the golf team. This year, we had 
We were number one in the Hoosier Heartland Conference in golf, and we won sectionals, and we had one of our golf athletes went to regional. He's a junior, so I can only imagine what he's gonna do next year. This is our baseball team right here, who they've won one regional and three sectionals. So they fell short to that school in this district, you know, Carroll, by one run, but we won't talk about that. Okay, <laughs> it is no secret that the word referendum has been thrown out. I can, I still remember the very first board meeting that I ever did as superintendent last July. This is awesome. I sit down, I'm doing this board, I'm already nervous about everything. We, I, we had a financial expert come in, presentation, because I thought that would be a good way to start talking about the finances and, you know, we're getting ready to do budget. And we get all finished with this, and then the next thing I know, Board president goes, we might need a referendum. I looked at him and I'm like, what? I just started. So we have been. The referendum word has been out. We have been considering it. So it's been a talk. So today that's what this is about. We have been talking in great deals in detail about the different things going on with our finances. And so that's really today what I want to present. This isn't something we've just come up, pulled out of a hat today. This has been kind of a year-long process of us looking to see how are we going to fund our educational programs. Speaking of funding, before I start just throwing a bunch of stuff at you, I feel like it's very important to do a little school finance 101 so you understand. School financing is very different than any other financing that you've ever seen. It's very different because we have multiple funding sources. So I feel like it's important that we kind of go through those steps with you. There was, back in 2019, a legislative change. There used to be what I called four buckets. So basically, in 2019, they created two buckets. We have what's called the Education Fund that used to be operations, or I'm sorry, used to be our um, general fund. And then we have the Operation Fund that had the operating expenses, your capital project, transportation, bus replacement, all those funds went into there. So let's first look at the education fund. Okay, the education fund is funded by what's called the state basic grant. That money, we're gonna call it blue money tonight, so every time I talk about blue money, I'm talking about this. That money right there is based on student enrollment. So it comes from the state, so for every student that we have, you get a, a certain amount of dollars per student. So there's two different fundings. It's important to know this. Now, notice that there's 85% of that money comes from the state, goes in that bucket. Okay, what does that bucket pay for? It pays for a lot of different things. Think of that bucket as, your edu as what happens in the classroom. It is all those educational needs so that we are educating our students. That's what it's about. It's about the teachers that are in front of them, their pay, their benefits, it's about the instructional assistants that are in there, it's about the resources that they need to be educated, it's all the programs that we're doing, all those things that create the educational experiences for our kids come out of education fund. You can't pay for that stuff out of the operations. Now, you're probably asking, okay, well there's 85% there, why is 15% in the other bucket? Well, there's a reason, because there is other key people who are very important in helping us run our day-to-day -day education, such as custodians, bus drivers. So the state has allowed us, for those positions, we can transfer that 15% so we can pay for those very key positions. So that's your education. is the operation fund. Okay, operation fund is a little different because it comes from your property taxes. So it's a totally different funding. So remember blue money, remember blues over here, that comes from our student enrollment. So the other ones are funded by our property tax. If you take a look at it, we've got three things, and I talked about this earlier, capital projects, transportation, and bus replacement. These are the actual daily running them, the physical part of the school, the not so fun stuff as we call it, but you know, electricity, 
diesel, which by the way has gone up like 50% on the last check, but I think it's more now. Um, so all of those fun, not so fun things that we have to do. So everything on that is operations. It's important to know that the operations items can't be paid with the blue money. I can't buy gas from the education fund. I, I get that question a lot when people are like, well, well, just borrow from one. It doesn't work that way. So it's very important to understand the property tax dollars and the state dollars, they don't really mix. There's very specific things I can use for that and very specific that I can use for our operations. Now, let's talk a little bit. The bus replacement, that's part of that. That's the big piece, transportation, you know, our gas and everything I just mentioned. Internet is also a factor. All that fun stuff that makes the school work. Capital projects is a different little piece. Um, you can spend you know, less than $6 million through capital projects. Now, that's those kind of things that fix big things. I just said you can spend like less than $6 million. Here's the problem I'm having right now, and as a school corporation, we are having. We only have about in our budget $3.4 million in revenue from property tax. Even if I wanted to do a $5.9 million something, I can't. We don't have that money. So we literally right now, I feel, are reactive. We're fixing things as they break. We are having a difficult time planning things. So that's, that's something I'm concerned about. There is this cute little barrel. And he's up there. He's kind of separated from the other two. He is an isolated fund that we, we don't really use with any other area of the school, but he's very important, that little barrel, because almost everyone in this room probably has a mortgage, right, where you borrow, you know, so the house. And eventually one day you hope that you pay off that mortgage and then, you know, you're excited and you get to do things and, you know, live life. Okay, well, the school has a mortgage too. Those are our debt service funds. The problem is we never retire. School corporations don't retire. We have to keep going and going and going. Our students keep coming through our doors. So school corporations, they pay down the debt, but then they have to reinvest it so that we can fix the ongoing repairs and maintain the school buildings and do all that. Right now, we're having the exciting repairs at the middle school, high school for pipes and HVAC and all that fun stuff. But it has to happen. As you all know, things break. I mean, our home right now, we're like at about 18 years and everything's falling apart. So same with the school corporation, we have to have that fund. It is extremely important to know though, we can't just spend money out of that fund. The, the, as I said, the money doesn't move across these different buckets. They're very specific as to what we can spend for each of these. Now, hopefully that is so clear and there's gonna be a pop quiz after this, so get ready, you all know. Um, Let's talk specifically about the education fund for a little bit. <laughs> okay, again, education fund, think blue money. Okay, that's the money that comes in from the state. It's by enrollment. So we want to kind of look and see what's happening with the state funding. How does this work? This graph right here is dealing with 372 traditional public charter and virtual schools. Okay? So Let's take a look at some of this funding. The lowest funding we have is Zionsville. So out of 372, Zionsville is 372, the bottom of funding, which is about $6,040. Yeah. The state average is actually 6,771. So Zionsville's definitely lower. Let's look at some other ones. There's Frontier, our neighbor. 322nd at 6,297. You get to Benton County, they're at 6,606. They're still below state average. Finally, Culver's getting pretty close. Oregon Davis finally gets past the hump of state average. And if you take a look, Gary up there is $8,202 per student. So where is Delphi? 
We are number 274 out of $372, or 372 school corporations. 644, sorry, $6,441 per student, which is $330 less than state average. That may not sound like a whole lot, but if we actually had the extra $330 per student, we would have an extra six, 6,000, sorry, 4,600, I can't even speak, $461,000 per year. $461,000 per year. Can you even imagine what we could do with an extra $461,000 a year in our programs? What programs could we do for our students? Seriously, what, what things could we add? I mean, that is a lot of money per year that we are not getting. So if you think about that, look at all those schools that are below state average, but here's something interesting about this whole graphic right here. Everybody except for us has had a referendum. They have realized that the state funding is not going to be sufficient enough to maintain the programming that they have educationally. They realize that it is not going to keep everything afloat. So they have had referendums. Okay, let's take a look a little closer. I should add uh, that other graph. Actually, one out of five school corporations have had a referendum in the state of Indiana, by the way. Take a look at this graph right here. Let's just kind of take a look again. We're looking at the educational money. So we're going to look at state funding over time. Back in 2010, we, the state had a significant budget cut. They were, they were struggling. So of course they cut education spending. So they cut how much they were giving schools. Now this is not just Delphi Community School Corporation. Every single school corporation was impacted. So this isn't just us. But it was significant. So as you can see that dip happening, during this time, you still have your students coming through the door. So guess what happened? We cut programming. Uh, fine arts was one we really chopped, which is sad, but it got chopped during this time. We riffed teachers, which means we actually cut teachers. And those teachers that we cut were those extras. So they were those CTE classes, which is your career technical education. So business went bye-bye. There's all sorts of the extra stuff had to go so we can make the budget. That's what happened. We, we lost, we also made class sizes larger. So that it was a significant hit. But now, here's what's really interesting to me. The, the 2022 where we are currently. Take a look at that bar and the bar at the beginning. Do you notice that we are making the same amount for student enrollment as we were from 12 years ago? That kind of scares me. So I am sure that there is like, everyone's the same, gas is the same from 2010, everything's the same, right? All our educational resources. So no, we are literally making the same amount from 12 years ago. And because of that, we have cut things, we brought some things back. We, we decided the arts are important, so we brought the arts back. There's still items that are gone that we cut from educational programming. Obviously, we made class sizes larger. They're still there. But if the state had actually gone with an inflation rate, we would be having $11.7 million this year in funding. That's kind of significant. So, okay, let's look at this from a different way. So that graph was basically from the past going forward. This graph is future. So now we're looking at future funding. So it's, this was, we did this presentation, our financial consultant came on May 23rd of a board meeting and actually did some financial planning ahead because we asked, hey, what's going on? Give us some numbers. So this is one of the graphs that they had, so we, we borrowed it. This shows the balance left in the education fund, again, that blue money, all the classroom money, when you compare the revenue to the expenses. The first couple of years are actual, okay? So they're there. And so as we get through this part, you're gonna notice that the balance for this 
starts to decline and we have to keep a cash balance a fifteen percent cash balance everyone knows in your savings account you don't go zero right school corporation needs to make sure we don't go zero so you have to keep that fund so if we continue to look at this over the next eight years the projected loss is 14 million dollars if we stay the same and this is not even us gaining staff this is staying same amount of staff a little bit of a raise with our staff but we all know the inflation and i think we factored in about three percent inflation so if you take a look at this here is where we're, we're headed if we just stay status quo i'm a planner so i like to look ahead doom or gloom or, or positive you gotta plan ahead because i don't want us to fall off the cliff so here is where we're at now the financial consultant in that may 23rd meeting talked about a lot of different levers that we can pull to try to manage this and there's some levers that we can control but ultimately if we don't cut programming we are not going to have the additional revenue to sustain some of the stuff that we are doing currently which is sad because our students deserve it okay there's some other things you know we, i keep talking about the blue money and about enrollment so i kind of i want to talk about what the trend is with our enrollment right now in carroll county the number of student age children living in our district has currently dropped 7.7 percent in five years that's just the students that are currently living but this chart right here shows some good news that number of students out of the population that are enrolled in schools has really only dropped by seven percent the reason is because we've got some outside transfer students starting in here that is the good news because of our small school corporation and all the programs we are still <coughs> currently offering because of our athletics and our bands and our art programs we are actually getting a lot of students who are transferring into our school corporation the green obviously is students that have transferred in so our resulting enrollment has actually only dropped by two percent thanks to the transfers and actually in 2022 we are only down 18 students from 2017 which is pretty good for a small school very good so why are they coming the opportunities the great teaching staff all the different things that our students have the opportunities for special education actually i i watched it when i was high school principal we would get special education students coming because of our wonderful special education staff but if every single one of those extra students by the way six hundred seventy thousand extra dollars that's a lot but the problem is what if we lose those students because we have to start cutting programs that's not going to be good so they're coming for the programs we need to maintain we need to maintain them for our students our children they deserve it okay here's some interesting things that we have tried to do and i'm really going to try to advocate that we need to to remain with these things right here if you take a look in 2017 we had 30 children in a kindergarten class oh my gosh i can't even imagine 30 kids in here i can't imagine five okay um, so 30 kids in a kindergarten class i don't know how we thought that was a great idea but we did we did it we we, we handled it all so um if you take a look at these numbers the average balance is out to about 70 or i'm sorry 27 yeah you love 70 kids in your classes when you um, 27 students per class about that's an average so we really looked at it and we, we realized 30 students in a kindergarten class is crazy that is the most formidable years we need to make a difference we all know that if we don't reach those children when they're little when they're the kindergarten first second third grade if we don't get to them at that point it is tougher the the higher they get up in those grades so we need to make sure we're making a big impact at those lower levels so we added a kindergarten teacher first grade second and third grade so our class size is now average about 22 give or take we've got some less than 
now how did we do that the state gave all the school corporations in the state of indiana what was called as or money for covid during the pandemic so we we chose to use some of that money to add those sections because we felt it was extremely important that we start lowering our class sizes we know the individual attention with our students is key and important we know our students are more successful we added four additional teachers which ultimately reduced one fifth class sizes at the time here's your problem though the funding ends in 2024 so there comes the question what are we going to do i personally believe we need to keep our class sizes here's another issue we need to seriously look at teacher retention and attraction the state did something like a year ago two years ago but it has to happen by the end of this year they moved up all teacher salaries to a minimum of forty thousand dollars which i think is great they definitely need to happen the problem is with a lot of school corporations we raised up our bottom but this group right here it hit they didn't move so what ended up happening is we have staff members and I know this is difficult to read but here's just the most important piece of this just for example our minimum right now is 40,600 we have 18 teachers with zero to eight years of experience that are making $40,600 or less. 18. Okay, imagine this. We have a wonderful young student, a teacher coming out of college and they're entering in and they enter in at $40,600, which is well deserved. But meanwhile, I've got someone who's been at our school corporation for seven years and they're making the same thing as those teachers what happens it causes the teachers to feel devalued it causes your school culture to crumble it causes us not to be able to retain teachers and we all know that we need teachers in front of our children i think we learned that in the covid fourth that fourth quarter during 2020 where we closed I think a lot of us learned that them learning in front of a computer was not really accurate and that kids need to be in classes. I think all of us can agree that really being in the classroom in front of the teacher is the best way to learn. So we have got to do something to attract and retain our staff. You know, I said this before, you know, those <coughs> revolving doors that are in really fancy hotels in, the, in Chicago area, you know. Having a revolving door at the school corporation is not a good thing. We do not want our staff revolving in and out. Our kids deserve consistency. We also have 60% of our teachers that have 10 years of experience. We need to keep our staff. They need to start here, grow here, become part of those children's lives and retire from here. But we have to be competitive. This right here is probably my scariest slide. I'm kind of worried because I have a lot of teachers sitting here right now. So just ignore me, don't listen to me right now. Um, but okay, so let's just talk about our housing shortage for just a second. Now we did pass the residential TIF, so we are adding houses. That, that's awesome. But it's gonna take a while, right? Okay, so like we have a new teacher right here, she's gonna wanna live somewhere. So what happens is we, we get new teachers here and they wanna they wanna live. A house, there's no houses, they can't find them. So what do they do? The Hoosier Heartland's right there. So they go to a nearby county. One of the most popular counties to go to is the Tippecanoe County because there's 50,000 houses being built at affordable cost. So our brand new staff members go to Tippecanoe County, they get in housing there, and then they get in their car with gas, it's really expensive right now, and they drive here to make $40,600 when they can actually go to TSC and make 43,950. That's a problem. And in fact, we have, if I calculate correctly, 26 teachers with one to eight years of experience who are actually receiving less money than what they pay at TSC. That makes me want to cry. 
It, it, we're not going to keep our teachers. And our students deserve excellent educators. But if we are going to attract and retain our staff, we will lose programming if we can't hire teachers. We've got to do something about that. And it's not just our teaching staff. Our instructional staff is another <coughs> need for competitive pay. If we are going to build houses here, people are going to want to live here and work here. We are the second largest employer in Carroll County. But if we aren't paying well, they're not going to want to work with it for us. So as of right now, our, we are having a difficult time with bus drivers, custodial staff, instructional aides, which by the way, if you'd like to apply for any of those positions, talk to me afterwards, especially bus drivers. And there, it's again, it's another revolving door. This year alone, we had, and it's probably up, because this was a couple weeks ago, we lost 50 teachers, bus drivers, cafeteria, instructional aides, 50 different staff members this year. We have a staff of about 250. 50 different people revolving in and out. This again is a concern. We have got to make sure that we're competitive and pay. Okay, this is, gives a little more detail on a lot of this information. It gives a different viewpoint, just to kind of see where we compare. This is data from the Indiana Department of Education, and we have to turn this report in all the time, every single year. But it gives spending compared to the other 291 school districts. Um, remember before I had um, our virtual in there? This one only has public schools, okay? So that's how it dropped to 291. So this is on a per student basis. The average state spending is 13,751. Comparing the local school districts, if you take a look at that, um, Benton's doing pretty well. They're 49th. Now remember we talked about the fact that they ended, they ended up getting a referendum. So they're 49 out of 291. So I mean, they're up there pretty well. Rossville, you can see Pioneer, 257 out of the 291. Remember that Pioneer for a reason here. So where are we at? We are 241 out of the 291 school corporations. That is low on spending. When per student, that is 12,000 $177 per student, and that is the bottom fifth of all school corporations. Only Pioneer near us is lower. Now, I hear this all the time. Everyone talks about, hey, quit spending. You know, tighten the straps. You know, let's, let's do less. You can do this. We can do this. But the problem is, if you take a look at this, we are not spending even close to state average per child. I don't know what else we can tighten. We are low compared to other school corporations in how much they are spending for educational resources for their children. Our children deserve it. Now, here's another graphic. This one's different. This is your per capita rank. And this one, the government agencies, they all have to turn in this information. So this is very accessible to get. But a school district's per capita expenditure is the sum of all its expenditures for a given year divided by the school district's population. It gives a better comparison of your efficiency of your district spending in ratio to the taxpayer base. That's what this is about. The state average is 2,143. Again, you see Logansport is doing really well. I mean, they're way up there on their per capita spending. Um, take a look at where Frontier's at right there. So let's take a look at where we are. 228 out of 291 school districts. Now, we are at the bottom fourth at $1,762 per capita. And the reason I said take a look at Pioneer, okay, we are bottom in both graphics. Pioneer was really low in the other one, but they have a better per capita rate. We are actually low in both areas. And 
We try very hard to make sure that our tax rate stays low, that we are not impacting the community. It shows. We care. But again, remember that operations comes from our tax base. It comes from that tax dollars, those property tax dollars. And we're trying hard, but as I said, we're reactive right now. We can't do extra spending. We can't do pro proactive projects. So there are a couple things that I request, I ask, that we, we hold dear to our heart right now in funding. If we are going to keep going forward with our, our future funding, I want to preserve these items. The first one is managing class sizes. And if we're going to do that, we have got to attract and retain staffing. We have got to do that. And that staffing isn't just our teachers, it's the paraprofessionals, the support staff, all of our staffing. Those are two key importance. Because if we don't have those people in front of those beautiful children up there, there is no education happening, as we know. We also need to, remember we talking about educating the whole child, we need to have programs with managing our social, emotional pieces, all those things that we're doing to create the leadership and those other cultivating pieces of students. We need to keep those. And I hate to even mention the Texas, but yes, we have to continue to keep our schools safe. We cannot slack in that area. And finally, funding for our programs. I believe our students deserve the best programming possible. And it can't just be a one fit all. It can't just be the academic piece. It's got to be all of it. Those programmings with funding academics, but we also need to have the other programs, the other things, the, the musicals and those things, but we need like our advanced <coughs> manufacturing. That would be another key. Um, we didn't just willy nilly pick the advanced manufacturing. We actually went around and talked to industries, and this is the biggest growing need right now for employers is advanced manufacturing. We don't have any local programs around us, so we want to be a campus site for all the school corporations for this. We don't want to cut any of these programs. Our students deserve all of them. So, at this moment, with that little cute pie chart that we were at, um, I am going to propose to the school board, after much research over this year, talking with our financial advisors, taking a look at our budget, forward and backwards, and looking at our needs of the school corporation, I am going to propose to the school board that we need to really consider a referendum that we have to have the additional funding to stay where we are at educationally and to grow. So let's talk about the referendum because this is really scary. This is what it looks like on the ballot. That is scary. I am proposing that we raise just under 1.2 million. Now, if you remember on the other slide, it looked like we were gonna be about 1.8 in a deficit. But we did look at some of those levers and some of those things and I feel like we can tighten up in some areas and do what we need to with 1.2 and be solvent for the next eight years. But let's take a look at this ballot because it's, it's scary. Um, there is scary language, and this language was created by legislatures. They changed the way the, the ballot looked about a year ago. So this is what we have right here. Right here. The underlined parts are the only part that the school corporation has control over. All the rest is from the auditor, deals with the tax rate. So all of this we have no control over. And it's scary looking. We control the length, which the maximum length is eight years. So that's an example. We have what those pie pieces were that I'm asking that we, we maintain and grow. And then we have a tax rate, which right, as of right now, it is 0.2032 cents. Now, let's talk about those other scary numbers. This uses, those other numbers use a, a formula to get that, whatever, that 21.9, but it's very confusing, because everyone thinks, oh my gosh, you're raising my taxes 21.9, are you kidding me? No, that is not what that is. 
That is not, it's not even calculated actually correctly. It actually reflects the tax increase that the school corporation is having. So it has something more to do with us. It's not correct at all, and there's multiple variables. So in reality, let's just look at an example. So let's look at the city of Delphi, because they have, in all the townships, they happen to have the highest tax rate. So a taxpayer in Delphi City who pays the highest tax in the district would see an increase about 7.5%. But let's specifically look at the impact. So we're going to take a look at an example. So again, that's that tax rate that you saw on the ballot, the very confusing ballot. And let's just say that we're going to look at a home with an assessed value of 100,000. Now, before we begin, the first thing people want to do is look at that top line and they're like, oh my gosh, times by 100, it's going to be $203. No, that's not what that means. They're going to go and divide by 100 and they're going to go, this is going to increase 20%. No, that's not what that means. Here is how it's calculated. Believe me, I had to learn a lot on this one. Okay, first you take, and again, this is an assessed value of $100,000. You subtract your homestead deduction. You have some supplemental deductions that get taken into account. Many people subtract, almost everyone has a mortgage deduction. Then that gives you your net assessed value. The net assessed value is what we use the calculation for the tax rate on, not the assessed value. So we take that net assessed value, divide by 100, multiply by the tax rate, and in this case for a $100,000 home, your yearly impact would be $66.55 and monthly it would be $5.55. We put monthly on there because a lot of us have escrows, we pay it through our mortgage, and so it shows up monthly on there. But let's take a look at some other examples. So, first of all, we're going to talk about median real fast. Median is median house value is if you take all the houses in Carroll County and you line up their prices, their, their assessed values, the median is like directly the middle house that you hit. It's different than the mean. Mean, mean can be skewed if it could skew it high or if it could skew it low. So you look at median value. So our median value is approximately $108,000 in, in Carroll County. So that's about $77.25 or $6.44 monthly. The bottom 25 median, so if you drop it at one fourth, is about 75,000. So that's 33, 53 annually and 279 a month. And then the top 75%, so right at the 75%, if I dropped, I'd fall on a house that's about valued 150. So of course there's more higher, there's more lower. And that's $132.59 or $11.05 approximately. So I gave a lot of information today, a lot. Um, and I really have a hard time because if my staff knows me, I like to walk around and I've been tied to this, this mic right here. So right here are the four things that I really want us to talk about. We really need to maintain our class sizes. We've got to manage how large our class sizes are. We know one of the first things when you have to cut with budget, we tend to lose our people. And our people are the most important piece of that education puzzle. We have to be able to attract and retain quality teachers. Because if we don't have the quality teachers, we don't have the programs. And as you saw, that is pretty scary details of what's happening in other school corporations. We used to be right up there and we have just significantly in the last little bit dropped with TSC, but it's scary. We need to make sure we have our paraprofessionals, our teachers, all the people that impact our students from pre-K all the way to 12. We need to make sure we're managing our social emotional efforts and our safety initiatives. Our students need this. We're gonna have well-rounded students. And finally, we really need to maintain our programming. All of our program, our students deserve it. They deserve the fine arts. They deserve the robotics. They deserve the athletics. And we need to continue to grow. We need to be adding things like advanced manufacturing so we're preparing our students to walk into a job. 
We need to continue classes like our CNA where they're walking out with a CNA license. Literally, I, had, I have had children, they're not children, they're big, but our students graduating, walking out of here with the CNA, working their way through college with the CNA, working the same job. I mean, we, they deserve those chances. Our students are worth it. The, our students, at the end of the day, and I always say this, and I get